Hey, I muted you. Okay, good. You got it. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> Then I realized I couldn't unmute you. So. Oh, no, I got a prompt. <laughs> I'm good. All right. All right. Well, only half the class this year, but um, I'll I'll start my introductions. How does that sure. sound? And that sounds great. I'm sure they'll all jump in. Yeah, no worries. They will. You'll have people. Don't worry. Um, okay. Sorry. Okay, um, I just wanna welcome everyone, both those in the class and um, those who are attending the artist lecture on YouTube. Um, um, I'd ask you to ask your questions or make comments in the chat, both in Zoom and YouTube, and we'll have some time for discussion um, towards the end of this evening. I wanna thank the SU Art Museum for hosting us on YouTube. And also thank you to Marty Blake for helping make tonight happen. Um, next week, there will be no lecture. Um, so those in the class, I'll be available during this time and I'll email you all about this. Um, Grayson Perry, um, had to reschedule. So we're sort of doing a double feature on April 1st. Um, again, I know this is, uh, Grayson will be speaking at 2 p.m. Um, with the Everson Museum. So those of you who uh, are unable to attend that, I'll make sure to have the recording up for the people in the class. And um, Liz Feng, who's a really great illustrator, will be speaking on April 1st at 6, 6.30 here on these channels. So, um, Okay. So um, um, I know tonight's talk with Benjamin Maura is gonna be a lot of fun and um, looks like we're gonna learn a lot both aesthetically and practically as well. Um, as an alum of our BFA illustration BFA program, Mara received his MFA from the School of Visual Arts. Um, he, sorry, I keep on, um, he also received a Grammy nomination for his artwork for the album Wayfaring Strangers, Acid Nightmares on the Numero Group label. Um, I feel like I've never been able to introduce a Grammy nominee before, so I wanted to make sure to say that. Um, his illustrations can be seen in Playboy, Rolling Stone, uh, the New York Times, Marvel Comics, Vice, Radar, Paper, Nylon, among many others. Um, his comics include Night Business, American Blood, and Terror Assaulter, O-M-W-O-T, which means One Man, War on Terror. Um, he will be collaborating with Grant Morrison on the comic book magazine, Heavy Metal, which I'm sure he's very excited about. You'll see some of the influences of that. Um, Benjamin will also be speaking this Saturday at the Geek Art Confluence. Um, and it, for more information, go to geekartconfluence.com. Um, Benjamin has described his work as applied folk art influenced by black light art, pinball machine art, exploitation movies, comic books, old school Dungeons and Dragons illustrations, pulp science fiction paperback covers, flash art, prison art, and not to mention various heavy metal albums art. Um, in Pace Magazine, Hillary Brown wrote, what kind of person would focus on this bottom shelf grindhouse imagery stemming from the B-movies 80s underground? Well, we are about to find out. I'm really happy to introduce Benjamin Mara. Wow, thank you. Turning it the, over to you. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. Thanks for the introduction. One correction, I worked with Grant Morrison a few years ago, oh, so I I'm already sorry. did that. That's okay. Um, so but I would love to work with him again because it was a really fun time really fun project to collaborate with him on um thanks for the introduction uh thanks everybody for being here um i am a grad of syracuse university i graduated in 1999 uh it doesn't feel like that long ago but it was more than 20 years ago now um so i'm just gonna get started with my talk um let me shoot this.
So this is my uh, presentation, Benjamin Mara, make cool stuff, don't stop. Uh, this is a self-portrait I did back in 1998 when I was studying in Florence, Italy uh, with the Syracuse uh, Study Abroad program. Um, and I just got to paint all day long. It was an amazing experience. So I just wanna give you guys some context for what I was sort of working on uh, when I was in college. But first, I'm trying to distill all of the things that I learned over the course of the last 20 plus years um, since graduating from Syracuse and becoming an illustrator and comic book artist or cartoonist. Um, so I broke it down and it came up with this phrase, make cool stuff, don't stop. This is basically, I guess, a mantra of mine. Um, and if we break down the words uh, even further, uh, make is our uh, art making process. By the way, I'm gonna be using the like you and we and our, so it's it, all of us are artists and, and creators. So I'm just gonna swap between, switch between those two terms just heads up in advance. So make is the art making process. Cool is the content of your art, our art. It's uh, what we think is cool. It's very individually based. Stuff is the results from our process. Uh, it's the art form that our process eventually takes. It's the, what we leave into the world. Don't stop is our relationship with time. Time uh, being the pursuit of art over the course of one's life. This is the type of art I was making when I was a senior at Syracuse. Um, I don't know, it was trying to be a children's book illustrator. I was really like angling for that kind of the, that kind of thing. I was uh, spending like all nighters trying to finish these pieces in the studio. Uh, as you can see, they're very labor intensive acrylic paintings. Um, and I thought that uh, this was a surefire way to earn money as an illustrator. Uh, the two bottom left pieces were done in Marty Blake's class, by the way. Um, this is the type of work that I was doing when I got out of school. And I couldn't, uh, I kind of hit a wall and I was struggling and I couldn't um, finish anything. All these are sort of incomplete projects for trying to come up with children's books ideas and nothing was really working for me. Uh, so I, I, I knew I needed to like change how I was going to work. Um, I'm going to break down each of these words, uh, drill down on each of them. Uh, and then I'm, and then I'm going to talk about my work in between. Uh, so make is our process. Uh, make is like the process of art creation. It's, uh, how you draw what techniques you use, where you draw, where you paint, whether you use a computer, whether you need not use traditional means, um, whether you work at home or in a studio, it all encapsulates that. And it's through uh, this process that we, um, this process is developed through experimentation, experimentation of different materials, uh, tools and uh, materials, whatever. Um, it's your technique and it's some, and it's where imperfection sort of needs to be embraced. Uh, so your tools, pens, paper, iPads, Cintiq, I use like all these things. Um, these have to sort of inspire you to make things. These are part of your process. Uh, everything in your process should, um, support the endeavor to make new stuff. Techniques methods and ways of working. These are things that uh, you need to also have, uh, make sure that it's fun for you to make things with these methods and with these techniques. So if you're working on a method and you're in, or using a technique that is not fun, abandon it and 
go in another direction. Uh, also, you need to embrace speed. Um, you have to work fast uh, in, in when you're experimenting because applied art is time-based. Uh, your deadline is, is a, a real thing in the real world and you have to be able to get things done quickly. Uh, speed also staves off boredom. Boredom is gonna encapsulate a lot of different things for me in this talk. Boredom is like resistance, it's pain during the process. Uh, but for me, boredom and disengagement from what I was working on was a real problem. And uh, speed is a way that I was able to um, deal with it. I like to think about it like this, like you're a, we're a surfer on a wave of creativity and you're riding that wave toward a deadline and you're trying to outpace boredom. And I actually just heard Jerry Seinfeld on a podcast use this same analogy for doing stand-up comedy. I like to think that I thought of this first before I heard of Jerry's uh, same analogy and thought um, on the same subject or similar subject. Uh, but he was sort of thinking about it like, like surfing is like a mastery of a force that you normally don't have any control over. And that's kind of the same thing with art where you are uh, taking a mastery over these forces that, that might not be something that you typically can control. Um, it took me a long time to sort of learn that, but the feeling when you're riding that wave is you're in the zone and you're feeling flow with the creativity and everything's going well. But in order to do this, we need to embrace imperfection. One of the things that I was uh, sort of saddled with in my college work that I showed earlier was trying to make a masterpiece every single time. And that's not the way to go. Uh, you need to embrace your imperfection. Picasso said that everybody draws a circle differently. And what makes everybody draw a, a perfect circle differently is makes them who they are. So that is what makes you unique and you need to embrace whatever imperfections you might have. Finish your projects. I stopped finishing my projects and it really grinded everything down to a halt for me. So if one thing uh, you take from this talk, uh, please finish your projects. This is the type of work I was doing uh, just before I entered grad school. Um, I was working in a newspaper and really struggling with illustration and drawing. Um, and I was just trying to push into new directions, uh, looser ways of working. Uh, once I got into grad school, this is sort of an example of what I was doing. Um, just trying to experiment uh, with different materials, different uh, tools, different uh, ways of working, different methods and different techniques. But I still went back to my painting uh, in order to enter into these competitions for Playboy. And both of these were uh, winners in this competition that we had in our grad school to illustrate a fiction piece in Playboy magazine. When I was working at newspapers, this is the type of work that I did, informational graphics. It was not fun, it was dry, but it gave me enough revenue uh, that I was able to support myself and continue to pursue illustration. They did let me do illustration from time to time. This is the type of stuff that I would do. The one in the center is actually a piece I did for a newspaper's uh, education uh, special supplement. And I was asked never to draw it this way again. Um, I was, took that as, uh, I took that seriously. <laughs> I never did draw that way again. Uh, I got a job at MLB.com um, later. And this is one of the first uh, home pages that I uh, worked on. Um, I worked there for 13 years and it was a, it was a great job. Uh, it also supplied me with enough revenue that I was able to live in Brooklyn for 10 years and uh, still continue to uh, make illustrations. Uh, so cool. So make cool stuff, don't stop. So cool. Cool is a word that endures for some reason. I got this, I read this article in the New York Times a long time ago. Um, why is cool still cool? I don't know. I used a bunch of different slang words when I was growing up, but cool still is something that I use today. So cool. So cool is what you love. It's what inspires you. Uh, and this is what is going to inform the content of your art. Um, 
so this is us we're looking at something in the world see something cool comes back into our brains moves around we the process this inspires us uh and then we have to make something because of it so then we make something else that's cool um and these things that we love are a reflection of our personal vision uh for me when i was making those children's book uh, illustrations i was making for those for other people it wasn't because i really loved children's books or i loved some of that content it was because I thought that that was going to get me a job that was going to get me paid to make pictures. Um, but it wasn't really what I truly loved to draw or paint. Um, this is the sort of stuff that I really love to draw and paint is like, I loved uh, really, uh, I love trash culture. This is like, I love barbarian movies and heavy metal and exploitation films. And I decided with these, uh, notebook drawings that I was going to uh, throw out a lot of the things that I was taught when I was um, in undergrad. Uh, I was going to just make uh, this this notebook my portfolio. This was, these were going to be my final uh, pieces that I was going to present to the world as the type of illustration that I wanted to do. Um, so I bought this notebook at Staples. I bought a bunch of pens that were all terrible. I was taught, you know, to always use the best uh, art supplies, and I wanted to completely forsake that. That's why I used just like crayons and you know ballpoint pens. And I didn't plan anything out. I was taught to do a lot of sketches in order to solve a visual problem. With these, I just started with one particular detail and just grew it out. I didn't pencil anything. I just drew straight to ink and I just let that be my kind of stream of consciousness. I embraced imperfection and I just wanted these things to kind of be like doodles um, that I would draw in my meetings during uh, uh, my time at newspapers. This uh, piece, Zombie Tracy Lords, is based off of um, Tracy Lords in the John Waters movie Crybaby, along with some Tex Avery wolves in the background and this got into American illustration. Uh, this is also some characters from old golden age comic books. Um, comic books are also a huge source of uh, inspiration for me. Black Panther is one of my favorite uh, comic book characters and the thing from another planet uh, is the thing John Carpenter is the thing is one of my favorite movies. Uh, so I decided to mash them up and this is um, Death Dealer versus Predator in Las Vegas riding on the General Lee and Knight Rider. Um, these are also based on some movies that I love from Beyond, Conquest and Cobra. I love uh, Stallone movies as well. But basically like this was an admission to myself that this was the stuff that I loved to, to make. This is the stuff that I thought was cool. And I wanted this to be my, uh, my illustration. This, this was gonna be my way of working. And it got me a job with Rolling Stone um, called the Indie Rock Universe. Um, and it was a four page gatefold illustration that ran in uh, some anniversary issue. And, uh, I worked with the art director for many weeks on it. And then I got the final approval on Friday evening and they asked for the final artwork on Monday morning. So I worked basically 48 hours straight on this thing and all the training that I had done in the notebook with all those drawings working really fast and just doodling uh, helped me finish this in two days. Um, I had to go buy a giant piece of paper that I could draw this all on that would uh, reduce down to uh, four pages of Rolling Stone magazine size. Um, so working fast definitely like paid off for me. Uh, this was also the subject of a 15 state uh, $100 million lawsuit against RJ Reynolds tobacco because there were tobacco ads that uh, wrapped around these this illustration and they argued that it um, violated some laws about advertising cigarettes to kids, even though the ads were for a 
uh, music download site. Anyway, it was a big hassle and uh, I got wrapped up in it and had to get a lawyer, it was terrible. Uh, these are some details from the piece. I actually don't think that this was like doodly enough. It needed to have a more hand-drawn kind of feel, but whatever. I also got a job with Radar Magazine. I was doing this thing, you know, where kind of like this doodle artwork was going to be uh, get me illustration gigs for certain subjects. Stuff. So stuff is the results of your process or our process. Um, these results become our, our art. It's what we put out into the world for others to consume. Um, it is the form, the ultimate form that our art takes, which is, you know, illustration, paintings, drawings, movies, whatever, comic books, which are, you know, near and dear to my heart. So this is us. We look at the stuff we made, it comes back, and sometimes we just don't like it. This is often the case with me. Um, but when you look at your work, it's important to just reflect, evaluate, and analyze it and see what, uh, what works, what doesn't work. And that's the only real, only the, the only way we can really fully learn from what we've done is by finishing projects and then reflecting upon them later. You're not supposed to judge or compare your work to what other people are doing. It's very, very difficult to do this. Um, there's a uh, chapter in a book on writing by Anne Lamott, Bird by Bird, it's the name of the book, and it's called uh, K-Fucked, K F. KD. And basically, this is a radio station in your mind that's telling you your work sucks while you work on it. And you need to learn to turn those, uh, turn that channel off while you're working so you can get into the zone, you can get to the creative flow, you can ride that wave to the beach, you know, and outpace boredom and resistance. Um, you also, uh, so if you don't think your stuff sucks, you can't also, wait, yeah. You don't, don't think that your stuff is also a masterpiece because it's not probably. Masterpieces are made uh, by accident a lot of the time. So your stuff is not necessarily for you anyway. Your stuff is supposed to be something that's cool for others to consume. So it's something, you make something cool, we all make something cool, or we look at something cool for us, then we make something cool. Other people uh, consume it, and then they make more cool stuff, and that's just the way the cycle works. Uh, this is my comic book, Night Business. This is the cover for the first issue. This is the first comic I ever made uh, fully. Up until this point, I was never able to write and draw a complete comic. But after a certain point, I was like, I just need to be able to do this. I love comic books so much. I wanted to make one. And I wanted to make a uh, sort of sex and violence thriller, soap opera, urban setting, you know, comic. I was watching a lot of these movies called Giallo, uh, which are 1970s thrillers from uh, Italy and I was just super inspired by them and I really wanted to make a comic book version but um, you know I, I had tried to make comics in the past and just couldn't finish them and this I just it, it was like climbing Mount Everest for me to just draw 22 pages and I eventually did and I did uh, mo many issues I actually ended up doing a 10 chapter graphic novel of it and, but once I finished that first comic, it became easier and easier and easier. But I applied what I learned from doing those notebook drawings to comics where I basically embraced imperfection. I didn't care if it was gonna be perfect or not. I was just gonna let the drawings be what they were gonna be. You know, if they were gonna be, uh, uh, you know, terrible. That's just, just what they were going to be. I was going to let go. I wasn't going to control it. 
then I made this book, Blades and Lasers, which is sort of like, um, you know, it's sort of like a Tango and Cash type deal, but like Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Barbarian, and then, um, you know, this sort of like Stallone-esque laser gun wielder. Uh, and then I started getting asked to do, you know, uh, comics for micro publishers and independent uh, comic publications. They didn't pay anything, but it was just sort of fun to do. This was another one. Um, then I was asked, I, I get, then I get asked to do comic book stuff for clients. So this one was for the Bavarian State Opera, uh, analyze, uh, it was adapting um, the Macbeth opera um, as a comic in order to get kids interested in opera. Uh, and then I did work for higher stuff, like this was a Captain Victory story I did with Joe Casey for Dynamite. Uh, I would make fake comic book covers. The one on the right was all digital. It was one of my first sort of experiments in digital uh, digital art making. Uh, and then I got asked to do um, some variant covers for different comics. Uh, and then I came up with this character which is sort of based on Canon Pictures uh, action movies from the 80s, like Invasion USA, um, Terror Assaulter, Amwat, One Man War on Terror. This is what the interiors kind of look like. Originally, it was published as a risograph book for um, a small publisher out of Toronto. And then uh, Fanographics and I uh, decided to make it into a complete graphic novel. And these are the books that I've done with Fanographics to date. American Blood is a collection of all of my self-published work that isn't the night business or terror assaulter. Uh, and sometimes I get asked to do comics for places like the New York Times. The reason why comics are good is because uh, comics can serve as your portfolio out in the world. They can go places that you, know, you can't and they can sort of tell a story and represent your illustration skills. Uh, because that's what you, exactly what you're doing. You're telling a story that can be very powerful for people. So don't stop. Um, this is time. Don't stop is time. Don't stop means, uh, or time is, is, is when, is a double-edged sword essentially. Time, over the course of time, you make improvements to your work through finishing things, reflecting and analyzing. Um, but it's also in limited supply because time, you know, is uh, not unlimited for us. So the way that I sort of break things down for myself is I'll have a big goal, like finishing a graphic novel, or you could have a goal, like a life goal, like I want to be an illustrator or something like that. But the key is to like break it down into uh, more digestible, digestible uh, goals. So like yearly goals, monthly goals, weekly goals, daily goals, and they're all cumulatively lead to this big goal. That's something that I had to learn over time. So one of the ways to achieve goals for me was to get a job. I recommend it. It's a steady revenue, you know, you can sustain your art practice, uh, but you can also, like I learned how to be a professional by working at these jobs. I also learned a lot of skills, digital skills that I continue to use to this day, a lot of publishing skills and things like that. Make stuff every day. That's what I try to do, that's what I recommend. Um, even if it's just for 30 minutes, it all adds up and cr you create a habit. And if you can create a habit that's strong, uh, it will not, it, you know, it will serve you well over time. Don't quit. I thought about quitting making art 
but if you get into a practice of making stuff every day, uh, sometimes you need to take breaks and work on another project, something else. But as long as you're always moving forward, uh, that's the key. Have ambition. So ambition is something that can make intangible, the intangible tangible. So if you like, you know, you want to become an illustrator, if you have to have that ambition in order to make it, make, you know, jobs happen and then money be put in your bank, which is, which leads to tangible things. Uh, and your ambition has to be greater than your fear of the work involved. You need to be fueled by it. Also, I just want to say ambition, um, have ambition if you don't have compulsion. Like I have a compulsive uh, habit to make uh, drawings. And um, if I didn't have that, I don't know if I would, if my ambition would be that great. All right, so make cool stuff. Don't stop. If we put this on its side and then we create a little bit of a peak here, and this is time, eventually this is gonna be your tipping point. So you're making cool stuff you're not stopping, you're gonna hit a point where eventually people are going to pay you to do the things that you would do even if you weren't being paid, which is a great thing. <laughs> I guess it's what we're all here for. Um, I highly recommend this book, Getting Things Done uh, by David Allen. Uh, it has this really great system, overall general system, for organization, and I think it serves many, many disciplines, including illustration or any creative, creative, you know, pursuit. So I started getting paid to do stuff that I didn't think I'd ever get paid to do, which is like create um, T-shirts for heavy metal bands in Brazil and get it to draw, you know, blade-handed. Uh, mutants decapitating people and you know giant man tanks uh flame throwing people um i got to do this some examples of some poster art that i've created uh for red bull um the center one is for was a poster and dvd cover for a documentary about skateboarding and body double this was for a screening in la um and it's one of my favorite movies. I love Brian De Palma. I did this poster recently um, for Feels Good Man, which is a really tragic story that everybody should um, go out and research and experience. Um, my friend Matt Fury uh, was, uh, you know, his, his character Pepe was co-opted by the internet. And um, it's an insane documentary. And an uh, incredible portrait of a time, a uh, recent time. But you can see the, the version on the left was our initial first pass. And then the second one was after all the edits were done. Uh, this is some editorial stuff, some early work that I did for, uh, I can't remember what the one on the left was for, but the one on the right was for the New York Times about a, uh, crime reporter in Miami. And this is kind of a breakdown of like the sketches that I would do for this kind of um, thing. And I had to like <laughs> relearn how to, how to do sketches, how to get back into sketching because I had trained myself not to like to make sketches for a while. Uh, this is like another process um piece of for for a spread i did for victory journal about a press uh, professional wrestler who had an insane insane story uh this is like the uh the fi the final sketch that we landed on uh this is sort of the rough the pencils the titan pencils that i turned into blue line non photo blue and I print that I printed that out and then with traditional tools inked it and then this is the final color version uh, 
Uh, this is a piece I did for Gawker a while ago before it uh, shut down. And this was a piece for Ink Magazine. Uh, and then I also do album covers. I did this for um, Little B, Lil B um, out of the Bay Area. And his manager came to me out of nowhere and just asked me if I would do this, these illustrations for his, for his albums. And they were a lot of fun. And this was an album cover for my friend's band, The Naked Heroes, uh, where I took the opportunity to sort of experiment with like doing digital painting. Um, and I did a comic for this album as well. All of it was digital. Uh, these are some hip hop album covers I did for Brick Baby uh, Shitro or Brick Baby. Uh, some album covers I did for Ketronada, DJ out of Montreal. Uh, this is an album cover I did for Mad Lib. Uh, some album covers I did for Zarface. Now I got back into painting a little bit. I figured it's been a long time. So I painted this last year. Uh, it's an album cover and the band wasn't paying me a whole lot. So I asked them if they let me do a painting and I was kind of uh, just wanting to try painting again. This was a lot of fun, but I burned myself out on painting again. I did these uh, around the same time for my friend Hoche Anderson's uh, novel. This is, these are accompanying illustrations. And I did this for uh, Bloomberg, but it was um, unpublished. It didn't get published. It was about Levi's and how they're not really um, American anymore. Like they're not an American brand anymore because most of their materials aren't made in the US any longer. Uh, this is the album cover that I did uh, for Numeral Group, Wayfaring Strangers, Acid Nightmare. This was the album album that was uh, nominated for a Grammy. Um, I was nominated along with the other art directors. Uh, so it's, it's a, a collection of sort of post Age of Aquarius, post Manson, uh, uh, sort of Black Sabbath, proto metal um, bands that were mostly regional. Uh, it's really great work, but it never really got um, wide distribution during its day. And uh, a bunch of bands were had their best songs sort of collected for this compilation. So we wanted it to be kind of like a uh, acid trip, you know, that uh, was kind of like a, a blacklight poster. It was actually printed as a blacklight poster. Um, the album itself was like a blacklight uh, poster. Um, it was a pretty amazing production. But uh, yeah, we wanted it to be like this sort of nightmare situation. And this was like the, uh, the interior uh, art for it. Um, so it's sort of like the nuclear holocaust is like the whatever, whatever what was sort of like on the minds of the, of the bands that were making this music. Uh, these are the pencils. This is all digital, by the way. I did this all with Photoshop, which is a program that I actually hate to use for drawing now. I prefer Clip Studio. Uh, these are the inks. And this is the cover for the uh, booklet that went inside the album and the store, I wanted the whole, uh, all the images to sort of tell the story of this biker who is on a bad acid trip and he was riding his bike and he got into a horrible accident and was dying. This is the, the, the cover it was like the visions that he was having as he was dying during this like Pieta 
uh, composition. And this is what the uh, products sort of look like on the interior. Uh, this is a cover that I did for American Illustration 35. Um, Matt Dorfman, who was uh, my schoolmate and roommate at Syracuse, um, asked me to come on and help him uh, with this. So I was he he was the designer and I was the illustrator for this book, and it was it was an amazing experience. We just uh, really went for it. We did this in uh, 2016. So it was around the time, you know, um, it was around the time that that dark days sort of felt like they were coming for the United States, and uh, uh, Donald Trump was was running for presidency, and it was just I was sort of trying to do a landscape of what I thought America might become. Uh, these are the inks. Again, this was all done digitally. Um, with uh, Photoshop. And then this was the interior art um, that we did. We decided to just like illustrate as much as we could of the book if we had like space. So this was like the new Messiah being born from a vat, you know, it's sort of like a cloned, cloned person, you know, and it's kind of like this uh, Burning Man type situation of whoever has survived is now like committing this mass suicide when their new uh, like clone DJ God arrives. This is what the book looks like um, in just some photographs, some physical photographs. So make cool stuff, don't stop. That's uh, the phrase, I guess it's kind of like a mantra um, and it is, can be broken down into this equation of uh, process plus love equals results and divided by time. And so it's kind of like make cool stuff, don't stop is, is, um, is now this equation. But results are the art we make. So it really is more succinctly art divided by time. Uh, and that gives us a personal visual language. Over time, our art becomes our own personal visual language if we continue to just make stuff. And that is what our style is. Uh, you're, over time, if you develop your process and you're making things that are inspire you and you're inspired by things to make things, you eventually create this art over time and you develop a style, I realized. So beyond make cool stuff, don't stop, I would leave you with these, these things. Finish your projects, tell stories, because stories stay in people's minds way more than just an individual image. Uh, you can do a series of images or whatever. You don't have to do comics, but if you tell stories, make sure you're, you have narrative heavy imagery uh, and develop a process that's like breathing. You, you want to create a process that has no resistance. So when you sit down and you're making things, you're not feeling like there's any, any obstacle in your way. And usually those obstacles are presented psychologically or mentally. You want your process to be as easy and as much as like second nature as breathing is and that's it that's what i got thank you that was great um i am okay we have a lot of questions i'm going to start with uh maybe our first question uh say Janice, well you know it everyone here is always in critiques and i think there's an appeal, you know, this how to get your mind around, like, how do you accept and uh, use mistakes? So, um, so Janess, how does your philosophy of embracing mistakes coincide with how you process critiques? So critiques, like, um, yeah, like when I was back in school, I mean, the, the, only, the only, I don't, 
I don't really get too many critiques other than maybe from art directors. And a lot of the times they don't, they're, they're just like, that's good. Let's, let's go with that, you know? And then we just proceed. Um, with critiques back in school uh, or critiques in general, I would just say like critiques can be really helpful because a lot of the times there's things that um, people are able to see that you're not like there are, there are types of behaviors a lot of the times that we do that we are unconscious of, but but then people still will judge us on these unconscious behaviors. And it's kind of like the same thing with art. If you're doing something unconsciously, sometimes it's good to have somebody point out uh, something that you might be doing. So I would say with critiques, encourage others to, uh, to point out the things that they see because you might not be able to see them yourself. Um, and it's, it's up to you whether or not you want to uh, to you to use that critique, like you or it, you see it as helpful, or maybe you just think that it's not helpful at all. So it's 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 up to you to filter out like what you need to dismiss and what you need to take as like something that you can use. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, we have a couple questions that's more about talking more about your process um two in particular like um could you talk about your process for character design or um and maybe related to this is how you develop stories for your comics i don't know if you want to take that as two questions or if they're related enough for you sure no i yeah of course yeah, I, okay. it's funny i um I took, I taught a class at the School of Visual Arts uh, master's program for uh, uh, visual narrative for three years. And it was all about character and character, not just character design, but like the way char characters function in stories. Um, but the way that I come up with uh, character designs is um, I'm pretty lazy. I'm actually pretty lazy about it, to be honest. Uh, I, it's an area I need to improve upon, but I, I, I usually just get a vision of what they kind of should look like. And, um, but I've been, I've been doing a daily strip on my Instagram and that character has kind of like morphed over the course of the last year, uh, or so. And I kind of knew that would happen. So, um, having an initial vision of the character, and then uh, I don't I don't like to do repetitive drawings just for uh, the sake of um, doing it. Just 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 for like uh, to find the character. Unless I, I really like to do drawings that are actually being used for something, like that are used in a comic strip, or that, that are not just tucked away in my um, sketchbook to never be seen, just for study. Uh, so. The, the comic strip was really helpful because I was able to develop this character's look and design over the course of a year. And I do think repetition with, with, a with an initial vision of a character and then drawing that character multiple times over the course of a story, over the course of a comic, um, really helps you find out who that character is visually and not just visually, but like who they are uh, internally as well. Um, but story-wise, coming up with stories, I usually just get inspired by something that I think is really awesome. Like the daily strip that I'm working on, I was really inspired by this Canadian television show called Degrassi Junior High, which is kind of like a, uh, yeah, kind of, I mean, it's, it's been around a long time and I was particularly inspired by the, by the version from the 1980s. And uh, this one character, his teacher in particular, I just kind of, was like what what does that guy do after school you know and it, that kind of like launched me into like all of these other kind of st possible stories but of course like for me like his story is going to be you know like a thriller kind of like thing where he's caught up in all this kind of weird violence and you know uh crazy crisis scenarios but um you know that's just what i'm kind of interested in uh so yeah, I, I, it, it really comes from, it comes from all different places, but I really come up with stories just based on like the feel of um, other stories that I read or I see mostly, mostly movies, you know, some, some 
some prose stuff, but uh, other comics a lot of the time too. But a lot of time it's like a feeling that I'm trying to capture in a story that I, I really want to replicate this feeling that I get from watching other stuff. Um, that kind of helps with some other questions. A lot, a lot of students are interested in just how do you keep that motivation right. and c continually develop inspiration. You know, you've talked about kind of you're it's being attracted to cool things. And, what, you know, I think that's one main way and to keep things fun. Right. Um, but how do you on a day to day basis or over time? <laughs> how, yeah. How do you keep keep that going? <laughs> I mean, you got you to gotta realize that like everything that I just showed you is over the course of, you know, 20 plus years. But I would say it took me about 10 years after I graduated between um, when I graduated Syracuse, when I went through grad school and when I did night business, my first issue of night business, which was my major breakthrough for how, how I was going to work from then on. It was 10 years and um, it was a lot of struggle there. So, you know, yeah, it was like, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't until I was about 30 that I was able to, um, to finish a comic. And um, I think that it was just this constant sort of desire to ride that wave again. You know, I, it was like a surfer sort of like, wanting that perfect wave. And I just continually kept paddling out to try and find it um, and kept, you know, wiping out a bunch. But I think it takes a lot of sort of experience in life. So don't be too, um, you gotta be, you gotta be patient. One um, thing that uh, an illustrator named Mike Witte told me, he's, um, an illustrator from the 1980s and 90s. I think he did stuff for the New Yorker. He lived in my hometown and I went to high school with his son. That's how I knew him. And I went to him after I graduated Syracuse and he had this awesome studio up in the attic of his house. And I showed him my work, the paintings, those children's book illust illustrations. And he was like, he's like, great, but how long does it take you to make this? And I was like, a couple of weeks, you know, something like that. Like, putting in 10 hour days or something, you know? And uh, he was like, okay. He was just like, remember it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's something that you got to do for a long time. And that really resonated with me uh, still to this day. He doesn't even do illustration anymore. I think he's retired, but um, it, was, uh, it, it, was, it was something that I always remember. So, uh, I took that kind of with me and um, so to, on a day-to-day -day basis to try and stay motivated though, like that takes some little bit of like internal um, reflection and analysis. It's not just about external for reflection and analysis of the work. It's sort of like really discovering who you are and what you love uh, in this world and what you love from culture and what, really inspires you to make artwork. For me, a long time I denied the things that I love because I thought that they were juvenile and not serious and I wouldn't be taken seriously as an artist or a person if I put out there that I loved heavy metal and I loved trashy action movies and I loved, you know, movies like Giallo movies. I thought that that was, those were illegitimate art and a lot of, and to the consensus, out there they are illegitimate and comic books too comic books were seen as you know something that was like one step up from pornography it was stuff that was distributed with porn and alcohol during prohibition like they were not considered to be like art like life pursuits you know comics were where uh comic strip artists went when they couldn't make it it was it was like the dregs of all you know commercial art so it's weird to it was weird even when i was going to school for my professors to really understand why some of us were interested in comics because when they grew up comics were basically outlawed um but that was something that appealed to me i embraced that eventually 
a lot of times I, I went in and out of my love of comics because I thought for a long time I took myself really seriously. And I was like, I can't like comics if I am going to be a serious artist. But I kept on being drawn back to it because that's truly what I loved. And eventually I just kind of gave in. I remember actually in grad school, I was uh, thinking about my what I was gonna do for my thesis. And I originally wanted to do a series of paintings that documented the, the genocide that occurred in Rwanda uh, back in the 90s. Um, and I thought that this would be like a really serious piece of work. But then, um, you know, I was also on, on my spare time, I was adapting uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' A Princess of Mars as a comic um, just for fun. And my roommate at the time was like, why can't what you do for fun be your thesis? Why can't like adapting this comic, you know, adapting this, this pulp sci-fi novel into a comic be what you do? And that really kind of blew my mind. Like, yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be two different, you know, channels. It can be like what you want to do can be the thing that you do. So uh, that was that was a big awakening, but it took it, it takes a long time to develop like your serious interest in things and and um, and because you're developing as a person too. But the the key is to like not stop. Is is the, the key is to continue to make things and to continue to self assess and so and, and assess your work and uh, just make stuff that you want to make and make stuff that you know. Don't be afraid of the sort of things that you think are cool. You know, the things that you think are cool make you who you are. Could you talk a little more, bit more? I mean, I think, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, sure. Talk a little bit more, because you've really shared kind of a journey and there were times when you were doing work, maybe it was, you know, for those infographics, right? Like something yeah. like that. So maybe it wasn't quite like your, you in there but you still had to do that work and just the importance of or how do you get through doing that while you're also working on developing your own sense of self and voice right i mean i want to i this this is definitely a part of my personality that wants to help like make things I, I think that's why like i'm an illustrator and not just a painter um like i i I wanted to use my, some of my abilities to make a living. And I was happy to, you know, I was working at newspapers. I, I got a pretty good salary. So it was, it was it justified it pretty easily, you know, the doing the work. It's just about being a professional in a way, you know, you, you're not always going to be able to draw heavy metal album or paint heavy metal <laughs> album covers. You know, there's other things that you kind of have to do in order to do that stuff too. And, um, you know, eventually if you do enough of the stuff that you like, then then you'll amass a body of work over time and then you hit that tipping point and then people know you for that and they want to hire you for that. But it takes time to get there. And in order to get there, a lot of times, you know, you got to pay rent, you got to buy groceries and, you know, uh, you know, so you, so you get a job. And the good thing about doing informational graphics was it taught number one it taught me digital skills I had no mm -hmm. skills going into working at newspapers on the computer and much it's much different for you guys now but I didn't we didn't have like any computers that you could generate art on when I was at Syracuse it was not it was not a it was not possible and um it was a little bit of it, but it was definitely not. Um, it was definitely not what people were doing. And but when I got out of school, that that was the professional sphere. That's where things were done digitally. And I was lucky enough to get a break and get hired in a newspaper and do informational graphics. But the cool thing about it was I could do something visual. I could use my skills, but it wasn't going to uh, totally like take away all of my creativity either. So it's kind of good to have something that's a little bit dry that you're not necessarily like emotionally invested in because you want to save that fuel for your work, the work that you really want to do. 
and you know, so you can compartmentalize it a little bit easier. Um, working on informational graphics also taught me to have like a daily deadline. Like I would get an assignment in the morning and it had to be done before I left at night and not just before I left at night, before like the paper was going to be put out. So, you know, and breaking news happens. And so working in newspapers taught me to really like work fast and not be too, uh, too precious with stuff, which is something that I try to do to this day, not be too precious. Um, so it, it can be, it can, it can benefit you in like a lot of ways. It can sustain your, it can st sustain your, um, your pursuit, your creative pursuit of what you really want to do. It can, uh, through, through revenue, and then it can teach you things that you might not necessarily know that you need to learn. And professionalism was, was one thing that I really was uh, thankful to learn, you know, because uh, that's not something that they really teach you in school. So there's at least two questions that uh, I think are connected to what you just spoke about. Um, let's pick up what, um, there's a question about, um, let me just quote, you said you compulsively create your work. How does that translate into a typical work week? Do you prefer to govern yourself via a typical nine to five? Or do you work more organically? No, I'm all about routine. I think okay. routines are like the backbone of a creative life. Because if you don't have a routine, then you just have chaos. If you have a routine, you have something that you can rely upon and uh, then you can schedule around. And uh, it also pushes you forward. If you have chaos, you might not necessarily create. Um, and then you can kind of like, if you, if you also don't have a routine, you have chaos, you can also just sort of like say, well, I couldn't get to that today because all this other stuff happened. But if you have a routine, you have set times that you're able to, to work. Um, so for, for a week, I mean, I've, I've got more projects than I can kind of handle right now at the moment. So I'm juggling um, many different things, but that, uh, that um, book, uh, Getting Things Done, I can't stress enough is like a really important uh, was an important thing for me because it, it creates a system for um, be, for productivity. And there are certain apps on the phone, on iPhone and on uh, for, for computers. I particularly like uh, this app called Things, which is related to David Allen's uh, method of productivity, um, where it's, it's about sort of capturing ideas and then distributing them through your schedule. Um, so, uh, I, I, I look forward to like the times when I can sit down and work on things. And I already know what I sort of am going to be working on before I'm I, before I sit down. Um, so I, I have a very kind of strict schedule uh, for the week. And usually that's broken down into like the day. And then I've got specific hours that I work uh, when usually when my baby's asleep. So, um, but I, I, I've gotten to the, the habit since I have had a kid that I go to sleep between nine and 10 and I usually wake up between five and six in the morning. I work, I usually do, I'm trying to do a painting every day uh, then and I uh, do do my daily strip sort of when I have to, but that, that one I do very quickly. So it's pretty easy. Um, and then I uh, just, I, I, I do sort of like allotted work times throughout, throughout the day. But um, uh, it's not like really a nine to five because uh, for a while, I've just been totally freelance. Um, I do, I did work a nine to five for a really long time, or more like a ten to six, or a, yeah. uh, a five to eleven, like five to uh, one. You know, like I, I would work like weird night hours for MLB sometimes. Um, but um, uh, I think structure and routine is like the key to productivity, and that's how I get things done on a weekly and daily basis. Great. Um, also, this is going back to your infographics. Um, Marissa asks, do you have any advice on how to switch from working traditionally, like with pencil and paper to digital, like using an iPad? Yeah, um, you know what it is? It's really like learning a new language. And the best way to do it is to immerse yourself completely in that space. Like when I started working in newspapers, I had no experience doing digital stuff. And for I mean, I was thrown into the deep end a little bit because for eight hours a day, I had to try and figure out how this new digital program worked 
and it was like learning a new language. But when you're speaking that language eight hours a day, and you're just trying, and you're making mistakes, uh, and you're trying to figure out how to like what you want to do, and then figure out on the screen like how you pull that lever to do it. Um, that's really the only way to um, to to learn it. Um, and the same thing happened to me when I went to MLB is I, I, I had been working in these sort of drafting programs and InDesign and Quark at the, uh, at the newspapers. And then when, we, when I moved to MLB, it was all Photoshop, which I had only like dipped my toe into that uh, pool. And um, so that was a, another huge like learning curve for, for Photoshop. And then you, get, you just get really good at it. But I think that the, the way that you are able to to learn it is you have to give yourself an assignment, a project to work on. And you, or you say, you're only gonna do it digitally, but then you, and you might not have the ability to work on it like eight hours a day and get paid to do it. So just do it in chunks, like just doing like 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day and try and grow that amount of time. And you'll be, you'll be surprised at how fast you'll pick it up. Um, but that's really the key is have a project and then put in the time really. And that's also when you, you, you know, if you have a routine, you can build that into the routine to make sure you do it. And that's one of the things I, that's how I learned like how to start using like a Wacom tablet or Wacom tablet is every, when I was working at MLB, I, I asked the tech people to give me one. And I would, on Friday, I would devote the entire day to working on that thing and figure it out. And now, and then it only took like, a month of or four Fridays before I just completely threw away my mouse and was just working on the on the tablet. Um, Marty Blake has joined us. Marty, do you want to ask your question? <laughs> video? Or do you want me to read it? Why don't you say hi to Ben and Oh, I want to say hi to hey. Ben. Hey. hey Marty. Glad to see you and Likewise. glad you're here and yeah. um uh, love, love your cover for um, American Illustration and, and picture didn't make it clear, but those hand shapes in the slip case are die cut. Right. A hand burned a hole. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. As long as like gripping, gripping the, the side of the, yeah, that was great. Yeah. We, we yeah. really went all out, like even inside the slip case, we illustrated like the, the, the paper that gets put on the inside of the of the slipcase. So like we we just like completely blanketed that whole thing with like everything that we could do. It was really fun. And then what Matt did with the typography because it looks really elegant and yeah. old world, and then it all collapses inside and yeah, we wanted to have that like yeah that that tension between like yeah my illustration like the just the insanity of that stuff in this very orderly kind of yeah, um, yeah. nice like elegant design. So the, that's something that strikes me. It's not my question, but I just want to say like to anyone who's listening that strikes me over and over and over again is this idea of relationships and community in the field. And like the art director is not your enemy. It's yeah. not a combative relationship that those friends of yours in school might be your clients, your, your compadres, your colleagues and um, I'm a little older than you, and those dynamics have just been very rewarding um, through a career. And it's yeah. like the extra. Yeah, I was, absolutely. I didn't mean yeah. to cut you off, so please. No, 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 no. but just, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, when I went to grad school, I would say that the biggest reward of that was the connections and the people that I met there. Mm -hmm. um who are all you know some of them are like real superstars um and uh it, that was that was actually the most rewarding aspect that i took from that experience because the, the actual 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 schooling that i had there I, I have like mixed feelings about but um but the 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 relationships and the community yeah. that were, were were formed and, and the bonds that were created there were, were absolutely the most rewarding aspect yeah, yeah, that's a beautiful thing. So I have a really shallow question for you, which is why did you say you prefer Clip Studio to Photoshop? I haven't played with Clip Studio yet. Uh, it's like, it's like this. Photoshop feels like I'm drawing with a, uh, with a pen made out of Play-Doh. Even and, with a stylus? Yeah, a tablet. But with a stylus. 
and Clip Studio feels like I'm uh, drawing with a razor blade. It's like wow. so sharp and all of the brushes and pens uh, that I've found are the closest um, mimic mimics of actual traditional uh, brushes and quote unquote cool pens. Like it feels exact, almost exactly the same. Wow. And it's ironic because I'm going back to like this sort of dead, uh, dead line pen mm -hmm. uh, way of drawing that I, that I used to do. Um, uh, so I don't actually need to have this, a lot of like this like beautiful kind of arcing uh, line weight, you know, variations. Mm -hmm. But um, but in Clip Studio it is there and but it's that's that's just like one aspect and that, that that's the main reason why I like it. But there's a lot of other things about it that are uh, make it like vastly superior to Photoshop. At least as a drafting program. Got it. Got it. I I, I use Photoshop differently, but I was just intrigued. Have you played with Procreate at all? I have. Um, I don't like the interface very much. I think it's really sort of uh, counterintuitive. A lot, of, a lot of ways it, it seems like a lot of things that I want to do and maybe it's just because I haven't used it a whole lot and I'm just more comfortable with Clip Studio but I work right. a lot on my iPad Pro now mm -hmm. and I've found and the Clip Studio app on the iPad Pro is the exact desktop version of the program so oh. it's, it's it's there's no sort of like iPad version versus desktop right. version and I felt like the the, the uh, Procreate um, sort of user interface is just uh, it, it's just it's sort of built for the iPad in like a weird way, and I just don't agree with it. Yeah, interesting. I I, I really agree with you about that experience, that life experience of uh, working in the trenches and getting a job job. Yeah, you know, yeah. and uh, having and it also makes you really appreciate the production side of things. You know. Yeah, for People. sure for whom that's the end game. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it was, there was a lot of stuff that I, yeah, I wanted to do beyond the, the day jobs. And I was fortunate because my boss at MLB had worked at Ogilvy and Mather as a creative director. And I showed him my portfolio of informational graphics when he interviewed me. And he was like flipping through it, flipping through it. And he was like, okay, all right, have you got anything else to show me? And I showed him my notebook full of drawings. And he was like, this is really, I'm, I'm really, I really like this stuff. Like I, this is really creative work. And I didn't think that that notebook, that notebook full of random doodles would get me a job, you know, at Major League Baseball's website to be a web designer. But it just goes to show you kind of like, like you don't know who who it is that's working behind the screen okay. or behind the behind the yeah. yeah behind the doors or in the offices and they might have a connection to the type of stuff that you do on a different level than what the job sort of requires on its surface and uh and i was very fortunate that he hired me um uh, and he was he was one he was like the best boss i've ever had and he was also very encouraging for me to pursue illustration while I was working at MLB. And when I got involved in that lawsuit with Rolling Stone, Rolling Stone originally wanted to, me to uh, uh, come come in and, and, and have their lawyers represent me. And my boss at MLB was like, get your own lawyer. You have two massive billion dollar corporations between you and they, are, they will at the first chance destroy you if they can pin this on you, you know, if they can pin responsibility. So he was, he was a very important person in my life. Um, yeah. yeah, I was, I was always very grateful to him, but, but yeah, it like, uh, having a day job, I would not be able to do anything without it. So Mets or Yankees? Well, I grew up in the eighties outside New York. So Mets, because the 86 totally. Mets were totally. gods to me. Totally. I went but, to Shea Stadium in 86. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I think I yeah. did too. Um, it was, that was a great team. They were a wild bunch. He and, threw the all the way. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, and I, and I don't believe in the authoritarian rule of the Yankees, kind of okay. like they're what they represent. But yeah. anyway. 
Okay, sideline. We'll say that. I don't know. If yeah. Other <laughs> no, we have a, we have a couple more questions. One, this one's maybe more philosophical, and sure. two students asked sort of related question. Um, it's about kind of how you think of your work in relation to American culture. Um, so, Grace asks, would you consider your work a caricature of American popular culture? And Chloe asks if you think the style of your work contributes to um, negative actions or feelings found throughout American culture? Um, I think I don't, I don't consider it a caricature and, but, or a satire really, but, um, but it is that way. I think when I look at it objectively and when I think uh, about um, uh the work I've done, like I, I, I'm, I'm, all my stuff is based in in themes of Americana, uh, things that are like a part of the DNA of America. It's ironic because I live in Canada now, but um, uh, all of my work is really is really about themes of America and American history, um, and I, but uh, I don't I don't know if. Uh, I could, I don't, my stuff has always been um, pretty, pretty dangerous. And like, I think that I, I do, I'm attracted to like things that are, they're um, not very beautiful uh, about America. I hope that it's not contributing to negative cultural aspects of America. Um, but I, I, uh, I can't, I can't control it at, at the same time. You know, once you put things out into the world, it's going to live its own life. And even when you're working on it, some things are just going to be what they are and you're not gonna be able to control them. Like there's only, it's sort of like a sphere of influence that we have around ourselves then it's sort of like arm's length. And, but once you're sort of creating things uh, that move beyond that sphere and then they are sort of the property of the world. So, and it's sort of like, I know like that documentary that was made about Matt Fury and Pepe the Frog feels good man is a, is a really uh, um, amazing portrait of that, that sort of thing happening to somebody. Um, I think it's the most extreme example that I can think of. Uh, but basically he had a character that he created completely innocently and it got co-opted by really evil forces on the internet. And uh, he's no longer in control of it anymore, no matter how hard he tries. But um, I, I, you know, when I create stuff, I'm just creating stuff that I'm, I think is going to be um, really uh, uh, something that's like really engaging to my senses and something that I'm, I'm really, I think is I think is uh, unsafe or something that I think is going to like uh, challenge my own sort of perceptions of the world and the way I see things, and then um, yeah, and then it's really up to other people, to the other people out in the world to sort of do with them what they will. Okay. I'm going to give you a maybe a more fun question after that one. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Rochelle, has some. Would you say you're uh, would you say you are living the, the dream life your undergrad undergrad self wish you had? <laughs> are you living the dream life you yeah, wish you I, had? You know, it's there? funny. I, I think <laughs> I think that I am, but I think that I shot for something that was pretty achievable. Like I wanted to be making comics for a place like Fanographics. And I wanted to be doing illustration on the side for that. And I'm basically doing that. But um, I think you always kind of want more, you know? And so there's always sort of things that I think about, you know, I think it's healthy to want to be pro proactive and be progressive with your position and station and constantly trying to improve it. So I'd like to, I've been working with like some movie producers and trying to move into like movie development and sort of enter that uh, arena. So that's, that's exciting. 
Um, and, then, and then like fine art wise, I, I mean, I'd love to do more art that's just like self-generated because I don't have any problem or uh, lack of ideas. I don't need an assignment to come up with like an idea to make an image or a, or a comic or something like that. So I think trying to move into the place where like I'm developing more of my own ideas that I own and develop intellectual property that I'm in control of is, uh, is the next sort of phase. But yeah, I'm definitely in the place where I wanted to be as a undergrad. Um, and yeah, it took, it took about 20 years to get there. Some people it happens to them like, you know, within a year of graduating, but I took a little bit of a long road. Well, thank you so much. Tonight was really great. And you were, <laughs> um, but sharing your work and just, um, I think a lot of good ideas for just how to be a creative person in the world. So cool. um, sure and thanks thing. everyone for your questions. They were really good. I'm sorry we didn't get to everything, but I hope we covered enough territory <laughs> for you. So thank you. And again, um, ben, uh, Benjamin, you're speaking at 11 on Saturday right. at um, the Geek Art Confluence. And if you go to geekartconfluence.com, um, you can get all the information there. So thank you again. So. Of course, thanks. thanks that was my pleasure. Yeah, thank you. If anybody thank like you. has any any further questions, if you want to reach out to me on my social media or anything like that, feel free because I don't have any problem talking about this stuff, especially like art and process and comics and whatever. So uh, I, I did the same for like illustrate. I did the same to other illustrators that when <laughs> I was in school. So feel free to you know, do the same for me with me. Great. Very cool. Thank you. See you Saturday. Yeah. yeah. All right. Sounds good. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Now I can hear your baby. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor guy. Sorry. Yeah. It's, it's past his bedtime, I think. Yeah. So I just didn't want to. But that was really great. So right, oh, cool. let me stop the. Um... <laughs>